1 Corinthians chapter number 15 is where we're going to spend our time in our preaching and teaching. So I invite you to, to head to the passage there. It should be on our screen, so you can follow along there. 1 Corinthians is the letter written by Paul to the church in Corinth, and it is certainly one of uh, these very critical and important passages of Scripture that I think give us a wonderful description of what's at stake when we talk about uh, our faith in uh, not only Jesus, uh, his life, but also his resurrection. And so uh, let's turn our attention there and let's see what, what uh, we'll hear. I think we're starting at verse number 12 uh, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. Certainly you can follow along again on the screen. But, but if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? And if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless. And so is your faith. And Paul's making quite a claim here. Man, he's, 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 he's putting a stake in the ground that is, is definitely underscoring the necessity and the centrality of resurrection. As we keep reading, more than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. Paul's going to a lot of circular logic here. I guess he's trying to help you and I to appreciate that if we are starting from an assumption there is no resurrection of the dead, then how is it that we can even be proclaiming Christ has been raised from the dead? And we keep reading, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, for you are still in your sins. And then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are also lost. If only for this life we have hoped in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But Christ, somebody say, but Christ. Oh, come on, say it again. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. He is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came, through a human being, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a human being. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn, Christ the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him, then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For Christ must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. And the last enemy to be destroyed is death. Oh, the word of God for us, the people of God, let us say thanks be to God. And we're going to speak uh, from the topic today for the next few moments, dead tombs and resurrected lives, dead tombs and resurrected lives. Bow your heads with me, Father, in the name of Jesus, bless the word of God that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our hearts so we will not sin against you. And please send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. Let it rest upon me and even the hearers of this word. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. Amen. Pat the stuff on the chest and say, he resurrected me. He resurrected me. Now, uh, it is critically, I think, important to appreciate what Paul is trying to argue, certainly as foundational and central to the significance not only of our Christian faith, but certainly of the way in which you and I would live and act and move in the world differently. If we really believed that death did not have the final say. Now, it is hard 
living in these very perilous times, to be fully aware that life is at work when we are constantly being given evidence of the proliferation of death. While we were away, you know, we didn't have a lot of internet access, and so I really did unplug. Amen, me and Sheree celebrate 10 years of anniversary, amen, thank God. And <laughs> ain't she all right, don't she look all right, amen? Touch your neighbor, somebody, amen. With permission, amen. It, 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 is, it is indeed the case that while, while we were away, we were very much disconnected. And so I, I was not able to track as closely a lot of the developments that had been going on as it relates to you know, the current events. And so when we arrived back home uh, yesterday, uh, you know, I think you know, she had more text messages than me. I think she had hundreds. Amen. I only had 70 or something. Amen. She's a very important person. My wife is, praise God. Um, and, 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 and I was overwhelmed with all of the text messages and voicemails and emails uh, that were just recounting to me all of the developments of the past week of, of, of the, the, the protests that were continuing in Sacramento for our, our dear loved one, Stefan Clark, uh, who was shot so many times, autopsy says in the back in his grandmother's uh, backyard and a number of our clergy comrades and Black Lives Matter friends have been uh, pushing to keep the pressure for justice uh, happening in Sacramento and and uh, DeCynthia Clemens was another uh, victim of, of violence at the hands of the police. She was shot and killed in, in uh, Elgin, Illinois, I think on March 22nd. Uh, call came about her being, uh, having some kind of mental episode and the police showed up and she had a knife and, and they, they caught, it was caught on camera that they uh, killed her right there in the street. And, and then I, I had all these other messages about the Alton Sterling uh, a verdict coming back around the police officers and more videos. And then I was continuing to hear all these stories about our immigrant loved ones being deported and detained. Some got, you know, a, a good uh, pardon and, and released only to be swooped up again. And, and just, just a consistent flurry of just bad news. Soon as I got, amen, into the dock and we got uh, our, our phone service back, I, 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 I felt like I needed to go back on another cruise, praise God, and just, <laughs> just stay away. Because it was indeed for me a very painful reminder that on the eve of resurrection, we are caught living in between the reality of a promised future and a contemporary state of struggle, pain, and yes, even death. What does it mean for you and I as followers of Jesus, as people of God, as skeptics and seekers alike, to continue to live in the tension of that in-between? I mean, it's, it's quite easy, you know, to get over to the resurrection side and, and be filled with all kinds of joy and excitement an expectation when everything is resolved. But how many know when the resolution takes too long? You can be, you know, asking God, like, what's up with that? Anybody read this guy with that? Like, what, what's up with that, God? You know, you taking a long time. A long time. You, 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 you promised this, and this is what I got in my hand. Anybody ever ask God that? Amen. I don't know. This was a real church. Amen. At the 9 a.m. service. Amen. This nobody ever asked God, like, what, what God, what's up? You, 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 you taking a long time to come through. And often this idea that uh, the reality of our lived experience does not always keep pace with the promises of God. 
And what do you do with that tension, that gap, that in between? I, I want to submit to you that one of the most fascinating contributions of this text to me in this moment is that Paul is attempting to lay out some stakes in the ground around what is at stake for you and I if we count out altogether the possibility of resurrection. That resurrection is not just something that is a nice cherry on top of a collection of stories in the Christian canon, but it is a reality that if fully embraced would transform the way you and I live day by day. It is a, a truth that if interrogated to its conclusion may rob you of any opportunity to stay in a place of death when God is always reminding us that death never has the final say. Now, it is indeed hard for you and I to appreciate the reality and the truth of how God's activity can be present at the same time of it appearing the enemy winning. Man, I think we talked about this last week a little bit, that if God is losing, that means the enemy must be winning. But that seems to be some sort of an oxymoron because God can't lose. Man, hello, somebody. And if you own the winning side, if you own God's side, how many of you know that you are a winner? You ought to pat yourself on the chest and say, I am a winner. Now, just because you're losing right now, don't mean that you won't win in the end. Anybody ever been on a sports team and you was down a whole lot of points? Amen. I don't know. You was playing spades or dominoes. I don't know what y'all. What y'all? Amen. I don't know what y'all be doing. Amen. Cause y'all mighty quiet this morning. Amen. Bid whist. Amen. Y'all play that Uno. Amen. Any Unos? <laughs> Scrabble, Jenga. I don't know. And then you you were losing. All of a sudden, you stormed back with a comeback victory. Or have any 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 comeback folks in that building, amen. Folks counted you out and 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 yet you stormed back and overtook those who were the naysayers. Anybody ever been in a situation where you felt like all of your 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 win was was kind of draining out one side of you, but but on the other side you felt some strength being pushed inside you. Uh, you 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 were you were you were expending all of your energy uh, trying to make it, and you thought that victory was beyond your grasp. And then all of a sudden, without a whole lot of notice, you start to get a second wind, a new framework, a new mindset that helped you to realize that even though it may appear like I'm losing, uh, the old saints you say something down on the inside of me just won't let me go down to the pit. I want you to appreciate that it is that resurrection power that, that God has made available to us who are willing to follow Jesus all the way through the process. Now be clear, a lot of us, if we keep it real, we only follow Jesus when it's convenient or when we feel like it's going to get us the conclusion we want. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm like this, you know, it's like, you know, Jesus says to turn the other cheek or, or, or to forgive folk or, or to, you know, give all of my, my money to the poor. And I'm, I'm willing to do it as long as I got a lot of money. <laughs> and I'm willing to forgive folk as long as I like them a little bit. And I'm certainly willing to, you know, turn the other cheek as long as I get my last hit in. Somebody say amen. <laughs> I'm just talking about me. I'm testifying this morning, amen. Just trying to, trying to, trying to, trying to let you know what I be thinking about some of the time. But there, there, there is an opportunity in a, a situation where sometimes uh, the the result of of resurrection is only experienced by the few who are willing to go all the way through the process. And part of what I want to submit to you today is that if we are following Jesus, our journey does not end on Good Friday. 
Our journey does not end at the cross. But our journey, if we follow Jesus all the way through the process, will eventually have us showing up on the other side of resurrection morning. And child of God, what you have to continue to ask yourself is what must I do to make sure I don't give up too soon in the process of our resurrecting moments? Because the truth is, it's easier to throw in the towel when you can't see resurrection morning coming. I mean, imagine you are the disciples and you've given these years of your life to Jesus and you, you know, following Jesus was not a very popular thing. It was popular when he's feeding folk. It's popular when he's healing folk. But, you know, Jesus has some assassins after him, praise God. And it's kind of like, you know, uh, I don't want one of them knives or daggers to miss Jesus and hit me. Amen. And Jesus, you know, they're trying to get Jesus, and they ain't going to get me. And I'm trying to live a little bit too. Amen. How many know it's a risky proposition to follow Jesus all the way through the process? But I think I have a few witnesses that can testify that my following Jesus through the process gave me more than I could imagine I would have received if I gave up a little while ago. And child of God, I want you to know that in these moments that we're living, the seasons that we're living, there is a tendency for you and I to shrink our imaginations according to the situations that are before us. It is almost as if we are trying to fit Jesus or God's work into our boxes rather than unleashing Jesus into our spaces. That, 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 that sometimes our circumstances can be so overbearing and over, overwhelming for us that rather than unleashing Jesus, we are often trying to shrink him to fit our circumstances. But I believe that God is too big to to fit into your shrinking imaginations god is is a little too powerful to be held hostage by what you and i are only able to imagine based off of where you are on the course of your journey yes child of god your journey may be difficult but how many of you know your journey is not over Lord, help me to preach in here to somebody. I'll give your neighbor a high five and tell him you got a little ways to go. You got a little ways to go. And, and, and part of what, what God is wanting to help you and I imagine is how do we then take the limits off of what we expect God can do? In this text, the disciples and all of those that are following Jesus have to change their mind about the resurrection because they realize that if there is no resurrection, then there is no possibility for life after death. That the worst thing that happens to me will be the thing that defines me for the rest of my life. That resurrection is not just about what happens to you after you die, but resurrection is also about how do you come back while you are living and experiencing the moments of death and disappointment that are a part of our human experience. People ask us all the time, how is it that you all keep doing this work of justice or, or, or helping to mend marriages or working with the children in the schools or pulling the pookies and the ray rays and the shenanigans and the others out of uh, all of this harm's way? It's because a few of us have experienced a resurrecting moment that reminds us that death never has the final say. Mm. So even in my disappointment, I can hold out for the possibility of resurrection. Even in those moments where it feels like death is overwhelming my circumstance, I can begin to challenge the conventional thinking and experience and say that if Jesus has been raised from the dead, then my situation has the opportunity to experience the same resurrecting power that raised Jesus from the dead. And I want you to know, child of God, that is your birthright and legacy as a follower of Jesus. 
that you don't have to allow your circumstance to be defined by the death you may be surrounded by. But you can take a step of expectation. Somebody pick up your right foot and just act like you're taking a step and say, I'm stepping into a new life. Give your neighbor a high five and tell them, will you step with me? Will you step with me? Will you step with me? All right. Let, let, me, let me give you my, my, my first point, my first idea that, that you and I must realize if we are going to move from dead tombs to resurrected lives, you have to first decenter dead tombs. Somebody holler decenter dead tombs. Now, what's so fascinating about tombs and graves is that what is uh, often in a tomb or a grave only belongs there if death is there. You don't see things in tombs and graves unless death is the companion. And many of us have allowed death to be so central to our imagination and to our lives that we carry around the artifacts of tombs and graves when God is inviting you to instead put at the center the possibility of a resurrection. Isn't it interesting in the scripture where it says that if the dead are not raised and Christ has not been raised either, that there is an invitation for you and I to move the deadness of our situation out of the center of our imagination and begin to ask ourselves, God, can I put your work, which is life, at the center of every single circumstance that I am dealing with? Of course, I am uh, not oblivious to the life that is surrounding me that is uh, imperialistic and that is sadistic and that is predatory. I'm not oblivious to that, but I refuse to allow the deadness of this world or my circumstance or my situation to live at the center when Jesus has already demonstrated uh, that life can be at work even in my dead situation, somebody shout hallelujah. Yeah, it's so fascinating when, when you walk into this tomb, you know, the sisters were the first ones to show up. Isn't it amazing how the sisters always seem to be the first ones to show up to places? Amen. Uh, I'll, I'll let one of the sisters preach on that next week. Amen. Uh, brothers, you know, we, we a little late, late, let Johnny come late least to the party, but that's okay. At least we show up. Give your neighbor a high five and tell him at least the brothers show up. Uh-huh, uh-huh. But, 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 but the, 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 the fact still remains uh, is, is, is that it is clear that when the women showed up to the tomb, they were expecting to find a dead body. But the only thing that they found were the things that were associated with the dead body. I want you to appreciate, child of God, that when you experience resurrection, you cannot stay in the environment that was only created to hold that which was dead. Lord, uh, help me today. Uh, uh, how, how many ever tried to stay uh, in a situation that you outgrew? How, how many ever tried to hang with folks? Your, your mind, uh, you know, when y'all started hanging out, you know, y'all mindset was the same. Uh, you, know, you, you know, you did drugs together, you robbed folks together, you puff puff pass together, you partied together, you stole money together, you know, you cheated, you, know, you did all kind of stuff together. But one day, the deadness of your situation uh, did not fit the new you. It just didn't fit. Uh, you know, in some of our work out here, you know, there are a lot of folks who just have chalked up what is possible. They say, you know, McBride, this stuff is just not going to work. What you ought to do is just get your money, you know, uh, get, get, you know, get your power. You ought to just allow your circumstances uh, to be a catalyst for you to just uh, enlarge your own self. Uh, uh, and, you know, there may have been a moment in time where I was seduced by that kind of thinking but when my life was overwhelmed by the possibility of resurrection 
Now, I began to count out uh, all of those folk in my life uh, who were only able to see what we could not do uh, rather than have an imagination uh, about what God said we could do. Uh, and I'm here to tell you, God is saying uh, that death does not have to be your final reality. Uh, I know they may be killing you in the streets and discriminating against you on your job and your family may be on the rocks but I'm here to tell you death does not have to have the final say when you get full of the resurrecting power of the God of your salvation anybody a witness in here that can say I will not let death have the final say somebody shout hallelujah child of God you got to keep reminding yourself uh, that when no 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 I'll come back and get you later uh, you got to keep reminding yourself uh, that death when it is a uh, too preoccupied in your life uh, listen it causes you to have a ceiling uh, on your expectation uh, when you are over determined by death it, it creates a ceiling and there's only so high you can go it's only so far that you can see but when you put death to the side and put life in the middle you begin to see things that are not as though they are Lord help me today you begin to see promises before they happen I like Jürgen Boltman he's a German theologian and he talked about how we live in the already but the not yet that there are promises that have been made by God that are already so but just not yet I don't know if you ever lived in a situation where you believed that somebody was going to do something for you but not yet uh, you know you know you can change your life based off of the promise of an already but a not yet I remember somebody said they was going to pick me up and I'm, you know, I'm turning down all other kind of promises. Uh, uh, right here, no, this person said they're already on their way. They just have not arrived yet. Uh, and so, you know, I got a, you know, another offer. Oh, me, bright uncle, get you. No, no, no. They're already on the way. They have not arrived yet. Uh, then I get a phone call from this joker talking about what had happened was. Uh, and I say the devil, oh, he's so busy. Uh, and then I have to go back and call the next person and be like, well, you know what had happened was uh, I put my trust in somebody that was not reliable. Uh, I want you to know, child of God, when you put your trust in God, uh, God will not all only show up, uh, but he'll show up right in the nick of time. Uh, give your neighbor a high five and tell him already but not yet uh, this is what happens when you decenter uh, the death from your situation and I want to let you know child of God when you move death out the way you get to walk, it, walk out into new life the problem with the American church uh, is that too often uh, we are in tomb situations uh, and God brings us out uh, but we are carrying those things that need to remain in the tomb uh, out with us uh, God brings you out of the tomb as a resurrected person uh, and you dragging with you white supremacy uh, God said no when I raised you uh, I wanted that dead stuff to stay in the tomb uh, you bringing out sexism and racism uh, you bringing out greed and oppression uh, you bringing out all the things that God said uh, needs to remain in the tomb but I believe somebody is a witness in here today that what God brought you out of uh, don't you carry those things with you uh, that need to stay in the tomb. <laughs> Let me get to my question. Uh, so, so the first question that I want you to realize is how do you and I center resurrection and not death? How do you move away from dead things in your life? So you can open up the possibility for resurrecting things. What does it mean for you to let some of these things that remain and belong in tombs to stay there while you keep moving towards Resurrection Sunday? How many know that there's a whole lot of things that 
belong in the tomb. You ought to leave it right there. Friends, stinky thinking, bad habits, narratives, descriptions that are not able to give a full account of who you are. God says, I'm bringing you out of it. Some of you are tagging, we're trying to bring it right along with you. When, when they found Jesus, all they found in the tomb was a cloth that was wrapped, Jesus' body was wrapped in. When Jesus got up, Jesus left the cloth that was holding him because the cloth could not hold his resurrected body. When they came to the tomb, you know, the only thing they find, they didn't find the body. They found the cloth. There will always be things you have to leave behind on your way to resurrection. The question is, what must you leave behind? Only you know the answer to this question. I mean, I could go down the list, but then we'd be here all day. Somebody say amen. <laughs> How many know there's some things you got to leave behind? If resurrection is going to be your central reality. Close your eyes right quick and just, just say, God, help me leave it behind. Help me leave it behind. Whatever it is, whatever the circumstances, whatever the situation is, help me leave it behind. Last thing I'll say before we move on out of here. Verse 17, it says, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. Child of God, trust your receipts. Trust your receipts. Trust the history that you have with God. Trust that the history you have with God is more impactful than the challenge you are currently facing. It is no mystery to me that we can find ourselves so overwhelmed with despair when many of us are functional atheistic Christians. Where we, 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 we come to church, but we don't really center the radicality of not only the message of Jesus, but the works and the power of Jesus. Can you imagine how different you would respond daily if you relied on the history God had with you and your mama and them and your ancestors and them? You know, back in the day when we didn't have any other options, so all you could do was believe God. <laughs> now, now we got options. <laughs> I got a whole lot of options. So, you know, you know, God, if you don't work, I'm going to go over here to my boo. And if, if, they, if they don't work, I'm going to go over here to my bank account. And if that show never not going to work, amen. I, I don't even know I went to the bank account, praise God. I, I'm going I'm, to I'm, 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 I'm go to this and I'm going to go to that. And, 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 and anyone ever exhausted all of your options and you end up right back at the same place? This is a song that said, if you tried everything and everything else has failed, Try Jesus. Why? Because another song you say is that God specializes in things that seem impossible. I'm challenging you today. Trust the legacy of faith that has been handed off to you. Why? So you can have an unbroken legacy to hand off to the next generation who will have to fight and struggle and hope for the same thing. Don't you know that many of the folks who were struggling before you did not expect to receive everything they were struggling for in that moment or in that season? But they had an imagination about a future that they were not fully able to articulate. 
And so by faith, they seeded something into the ground that would eventually bring life into your own condition 20, 30, 50, or 100 years later. What are you trying to say, McBride? I'm trying to say that you got some receipts that you can look back on that can give you the courage, give you the strength, give you the power you need to keep pushing through your current circumstance, but you can't give up before you get to resurrection. Dead tombs only hold dead things, but resurrected lives hold endless possibilities. And this is what we have within our reach. You and I have the opportunity to keep leaning into resurrection. Of course, it's not going to happen the way we want it. It didn't happen the way the disciples wanted it. The reason why they were scared is because they knew that the empire was real. It's like, man, if I show up at that tomb, you know, the fellas, if I show up at that tomb, I may be the next one on that cross. So I'm going to hang out. I'm going to hide out. And the sisters, you know, their love and devotion, you know, neutralize some of their fear. Certainly help them to show up and be the first ones to experience the miracle. What must you triumph in order to be positioned to experience these miracles. Resurrection Sunday is about miracles. It's about wonder. It's about possibilities. And it's not about it back in the day. It's about it today. What others say are impossible, resurrection reminds us, is inevitable. It is inevitable that victory is on our side. And this is what this is what's at stake. Come on, stand with, stand with us for a few moments and grab the hand of someone next to you. Song says, Hallelujah. You have won the victory. Hallelujah, you have won it all for me. Say it again, hallelujah, say hallelujah. Hey, you have won the victory. Come on and say hallelujah, you have won it all for me. Oh, death could not hold, say death, death could, could not hold, hold you, you down, Lord. You are the risen King, seated in majesty, God. Seated in majesty. You are the risen king. Say you, you are, are the risen king. Come on, grab the hand of someone next to you. And let's witness this together. Say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on and say hallelujah. Hallelujah. You've won it all. Say you have won it all for Oh, death could not say death could not hold you down. Oh, yes, Lord. Say you are the king. And you're seated, God, say seated, seated in majesty. majesty. 
You are the risen King. Say, you, you are, are the, the risen King. King. Yeah, 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 yeah. As you hold the hand of the person next to you, Father, in the name of Jesus, bless my loved one who I'm touching. God, you know the spaces in their life that are being overdetermined by death and despair, hopelessness, pain, struggle. You know how our circumstances can jade our eyes and cause us to lose sight that life is within our grasp. Even as loss and even as illness and injustice and challenge meets us daily, we are also being met simultaneously by a resurrected life. I pray, God, that you will breathe into us resurrection moments, resurrection realities, a season of resurrection that causes every circumstance in our life to bow at the possibility and reality of life. Squeeze the hand gently of the one you're touching. God, I pray that life will overwhelm my loved one today. I pray what is dead and over associated with these places and spaces of tombs, God will remain there, God, as you transition them into life. As you transition them past these moments of struggle and weakness, Lord God, may they center you and your work. And we'll give your name the glory and the praise for it because you're worthy of it. Lift those hands right where you're standing. It's me, O oh Lord, and I'm standing in the need of prayer. It's not my mother, it is not my father. It's not my sister, it is not my brother, but it's me, O oh Lord, and I need you. I need your power. Somebody say, I need you, Lord. I need your strength. Somebody say, I need you, Lord. I need your resurrecting power. Somebody say, I need you, Lord. Lord, resurrect me right where I stand. Bring me back alive. Bring my dreams and ambitions, those dead, Lord God, hopes and aspirations lord bring what must be alive back to life so i can experience lord god uh, another season of life and hope and power this is our prayer in the name of jesus we pray one more time say death could not hold you you down, down. Oh, yes, you are. 